health related information on the following show provides general information only. Content presented on any show by any host or guest should not be substituted for a doctor's advice. Always consult your physician before beginning any new diet, exercise, or treatment program. Welcome to Accelerated Health TV and Radio Show. I'm your host, Sarah Bant. I'm a health coach, natural supplement expert, and a busy mom of three. Make sure you hit the subscribe button below so you're notified every week with my new podcast on Mondays and Tuesdays. And if you haven't already, join my free group coaching on Telegram with the link below. There is no downside. I teach you on a daily basis with tips and tools to enhance your health, and you will be a part of a like-minded group to support you on your journey in addition to truly taking control of your health. What we talk about in all of my protocols and supplements I discuss are found at sarabantahealth.com. Today we are talking about accelerating fat loss with copper. Who knew? Copper has been known as a natural antibiotic and essential nutrient for over 8,000 years. Even Hippocrates, who is said to have recommended copper compounds as early as 400 BC. However, scientists are still uncovering new information regarding the functions of copper in the human body and the benefits of copper supplements. And I have come out with the accelerated scalar copper because of its ability to help with immune system and skin and hair and eyes and so many other things. But I didn't know it was connected to fat loss. And so many of you have been complaining about this unexplained weight gain over the last couple of years. So we're going to really get into it with the expert, Morley Robbins. He is back. He is the creator and founder of the Root Cause Protocol and the Magnesium Advocacy Group. He's received his BA in biology from Denison University in Ohio and holds an MBA from George Washington University in healthcare administration. He's also known as the magnesium man, and we might have to have him come back and talk about magnesium due to his extensive research into an understanding of magnesium's role in the body. Welcome, Morley. How are you today? Delighted to be here, Sarah. I'm really looking forward to our discussion. I am too. And last time you were on, we touched on some of the other benefits of copper, um, eye health, hair, um, skeletal, but I want to get into some of the, the hidden facts. I always talk to people about copper as it's like that hidden hero. Um, it's, it's the backstage guy that makes the, the lead singer look really good. And um, without it, the show doesn't go on. So let's talk about insulin resistance relation to copper. <laughs> something light really. something light and i really i want to start I, and i meant to say this is that when people are looking for weight loss they are going for the quick diabetic drug to do so and there's a reason because when you correct insulin resistance and fatty liver obesity goes away you don't lose weight to get healthy you get healthy to lose weight so that is, um, th there's this connection between fatty liver, insulin resistance, and what's going on in society today, and, and copper might be the missing element. Uh, I would go a little farther and say it is the missing element, but we can say may. Um, <clears throat> so 40% of people on planet Earth have what's called metabolic syndrome. And it's a spectrum disorder, as you know, that involves <clears throat> heart disease, cancer, um, fatty liver disease, diabetes being a principal factor. And so all these conditions are all related to each other if you understand the many metabolic functions of bioavailable copper. And again, copper is a unique I love the phrase hidden hero 
but I will steal 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 yeah. it. But I will give you quote uh, recognition for the phrase. But the thing is, um, people just don't understand what this mineral does, and we're, we'll have a chance to get into the weeds of it as we have this discussion about insulin resistance and trying to improve fat metabolism. But when you get into the world of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, there's some very important studies that, that your listeners are probably would like to dig into. Um, to me, the easiest is Song, S-O-N-G, McCarthy, like Paul McCarthy, not Paul McCartney, McCarthy, C-M-C-C-A-R-T-H-Y. Uh, they have articles from 2012, 2015, and 2018. And what they do is link low bioavailable copper, low retinol, and high iron as the principal agents to create fatty liver disease. Mm -hmm. And so what happens inside the liver is the what people need to understand is that the liver was designed by our maker and mother nature to be a storage depot for copper and retinol. Mm. It was never intended to be an iron locker. And that's what it's been that's what it's become in the modern era. But since 1928, scientists have known that if you deny copper in the diet, iron will rise in the liver. It's it's axiomatic. It's, a, it's like a sea salt. Soon as copper goes low, iron goes high. And as that iron builds in the liver, it begins to disrupt many of the enzyme functions that are uh, critical to, to take place inside the liver. And one of the key mechanisms is for fat metabolism to take place. And what a lot of people don't know is that the mechanism to get fat into the mitochondria, it's uh, acyl carnitine transferase. Um, well, that enzyme doesn't work without copper. So right out of the blocks, we've got a problem. We can't, can't get fat into the mitochondria. Well, then we have what are called beta oxidation enzymes. <clears throat> they don't work without copper. Now, I've, I've read probably about 10,000 articles in the last 14 years. I found one, one that revealed the difference between burning sugar and burning fat in the mitochondria. One. Mm. And when you read um, Primal Body, Primal Mind, what the author tells us is that early man and early woman ate the fattest meat they could find. Mm -hmm. We're designed to eat protein and fat. We're not designed to eat sugar. That's not, our mitochondria are really not designed to do that. And you gotta have copper. Now, the catch is, the catch 22, is you can't absorb copper unless you have fat in your diet. Mm -hmm. And then the flip side is you can't metabolize fat unless you have mm -hmm. copper in your body and in your cells. And so the scientists have been studying this dynamic between copper and iron and retinol for a couple of decades now as it relates to um, fatty liver disease. And what your listeners probably know about is fructose and high fructose corn syrup. Well, there's no faster way to mess up the liver than the high fructose corn syrup. Because what it does is it blocks copper uptake in the front door and to some extent the garage door for getting copper into the cell, getting copper into the metabolism. So the front door is called CTR1, copper transporter one. Very important front door, copper can't get in. And high fructose corn syrup is, has been established as a inhibitor of getting copper into the body. 
So I, I want to stop you real quick to emphasize this because if you're listening and you think you're eating a healthy diet and you're not eating um, the sugary foods that are packaged in the market, I have a package of Wagyu beef hot dogs in my freezer that I thought were healthy when I bought them. And I look on the package and there's high fructose corn syrup in it. So this is hidden in our dairy, in our meats, in our foods that we eat are healthy. So you have to be more um, proactive in looking at these labels and really sticking to a whole food diet. So Everybody be on guard that this is in everyone's diet, unless you are being very persistent with looking at your labels. And you're lucky that they listed it as high fructose corn syrup, because about a year or two ago, they changed it to corn sugars. Because they know that people are catching on to the game. So you get, if it, as soon as you see the word corn, you might just put the package back. You just don't want to get, get anywhere near it. Yeah. So um, all, the, all the juices and drinks that we used besides water are going to have high fructose corn syrup. I guarantee it. And so it's a it's an absolute metabolic poison. And it has particular affinity for the liver. You can't break down fructose anywhere but the liver. And what it does is fructose causes energy loss in the liver. It's just the, the metabolic properties. And what what happens is there's a principal pathway to break down sugars. It's called the glucose pathway. It's what just about every article will describe. Well, there's an alternate pathway for breaking down sugar, and it's called the AR polyol pathway. So polyol, what the OL and that polyol is referring to is sugar alcohols. You've, you probably have heard of inositol or sorbitol, you know, mannitol. Well, those are, those are sugar alcohols, and they're broken down in this pathway. Mm -hmm. And what triggers this, and there's books about this now with um, David Perlmutter, Drop Acid, or Rick Johnson's um, Nature Wants Us to Be Fat, uh, I was actually in a meeting with him a couple, about a month and a half ago, and I said, nature does not want us to be fat. <laughs> nature wants us to be in balance. And he smiled and he said, you're right, Morley. And so um, the thing is, if we, don't, if we don't deal with this fructose problem, it's going to burn out our liver. And, and the issue is that AR stands for aldose, reductase, just the name of, of the pathway, aldose reductase polyol pathway, and it's a beast inside our body. Why? Because it creates a copper crisis. And when fructose gets broken down, the next sugar that gets created is called sorbitol. Sorbitol is not our friend. Sorbitol and this is based on research from Dr. Briggs from 1981, Sorbitol chelates 98% of the available copper. Mm. Basically, it's a, it's a vacuum cleaner to pull copper out. So we've got this dynamic. We've got fructose at the front end blocking copper uptake. We've got Sorbitol, the next metabolic um, property, the next metabolite is sucking up copper. And then it begs the question, well, where, where's this copper coming from? It's a, it's a really good question. So that I think we've talked about the copper protein called ceruloplasmin. Mm -hmm. It's a very important protein in our blood. It's a, it has many different functions. But one of its principal jobs is to deliver copper to the mitochondria. It's really important, especially the, the liver mitochondria. Um, and just to put it on scale, the, the liver the hepatocytes have about 10,000 mitochondria per cell. So it's really important that they get access to copper because the, the mitochondria 
are dependent on copper to do their work. And so we've got this crisis with copper. We've got the, the liver is not getting access the way it's supposed to. And we're losing energy because to break down fructose, you have to expend energy to break it down. And then what's going to happen is we're going to start to make more uric acid. Mm. Uric acid is not our friend. And when I was having lunch with, with Rick Johnson, I swallowed hard. And I said, Rick, I have this theory. I said, when we're not making energy, when we're not making ATP, we're making uric acid. And he smiled and he said, you're absolutely right, Morley. Mm -hmm. And then we fist pumped on that. So to, to emphasize this, food is supposed to make energy. Right. You're supposed to get energy from food. And fructose is actually stealing energy from you. And I had this conversation with my teenage daughter, who's an athlete, because she wants to get applesauces for quick energy to have right before a workout. And I said, just so you know, that fructose without the fiber is actually stealing the energy that you think you want for your workout. So wanted to emphasize that as well. Yeah, it, it, it's absolutely mind-numbing what, what that one sweetener does. And so when you, what's important really to, to connect, though, is that when blood sugar is rising in the body, because it's not being metabolized right, it blows up ceruloplasmin, and the copper comes out, comes out of its protein, and so we have this rising level of what's called unbound copper. Some practitioners love to call it copper toxic or co copper toxicity. It's that copper is never unbound. It might not be bound to ceruloplasm, but it's going to be bound to albumin. It's going to be bound to histidine. It's going to be down, bound to coop, um, some, some copper protein, transcuprine, or something like that. But it's never unbound. And the amount of unbound copper inside the cell is 0 0.2101. So it's, it's infinitesimal. It's just no unbound copper inside the cell. And that's the searing research of um, Svetlana Lutsenko at Johns Hopkins. She's a world-renowned copper expert. But back to the story. So we have this liver that's struggling to make energy, and it's now being exposed to a lot of uric acid. And what's really behind it is um, there's a, a basic metabolic breakdown in the mitochondria. And when the, when the mitochondria can't make energy, they start to break down the scaffolding, will do anything to find sources of phosphate. And think of it this way. Think, picture being in a log cabin in the dead of winter and you start to run out of firewood. And so you start taking apart your log cabin so you can burn fire in the firewood. And, and that's what's happening inside the mitochondria. It's breaking down nucleotides, and the, and the final nucleotide that's left is um, it's called xanthine, and then xanthine becomes uric acid. And uric acid... When it's in our blood, it's considered an antioxidant. When it's rising in our cell, it's a prooxidant, and it's wreaking havoc. And that's where the real crisis is taking place. Um, the, the irony of this whole thing, and I think you'll find this fascinating, why your listeners are benefiting from, from your product, and I, I've got one, and there's several out on the market. But the point is, I was stunned when I found an article from the 1980s that indicated that copper blocks the polyol pathway. Mm. So that's how our ancestors got away with it. They weren't, they weren't being exposed to glyphosate. They weren't being exposed to high fructose corn syrup. They weren't being exposed to the level of antibiotics that we are. And so their copper status 
was not as compromised as ours is in the modern era. And I'm not sure people realize that copper is the target, but it is, because you can't make energy and you can't burn fat without it. And so what, what happens is when the, the beta oxidation enzymes can't work, the signal goes over to the nucleus, start what's called fatty acid synthesis. It's, it's the FAS gene, fatty acid synthase. And what it does, is it makes fatty acids. And it's really good at it. And it starts to make triglycerides and related um, lipids. And they start to build up in the liver. And that's why it's called fatty liver disease. And, and so most people don't know that. Most practitioners don't know that. But, but as soon as copper goes into a deficit position, the FAS gene kicks in and you start to make fatty acids instead of burning them. And the other really critical step in this process, there's, there's two more blockbuster issues that I think you'll enjoy, Sarah. One is um, there's an, an enzyme, it's called PDE3 phosphodiesterase 3. And in order to burn fat, copper needs to come in and block it. And if you can't block PDE3, you're not going to be able to burn fat. Mm. So copper is an obligate inhibitor of PDE3 so that the beta oxidation can take place. Mm. But now let's get into the Let's get into the graduate level um, dynamics because I think this is really important. And it's it initially is going to make people feel uncomfortable because it's new information. But as they hear it more and more and we have other conversations, I think it'll become more commonplace. There, we, we live on a planet where, as you said, we've got to make energy from our food. And the way we do that is we oxidize it. We use oxygen to burn it, right? And if we burn a unit of glucose, we can make anywhere from 32 to 36 ATP. That's pretty cool. If we use fat, a unit of fat, we can get 140 units of ATP. That's why fat is so important. You've got this multiplier effect of, of making energy. And... If we don't have oxygen, it's called fermentation. Mm -hmm. And we make two units of energy. Well, well what is cancer? Cancer is fermentation. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of cells, and so it's making up for the loss of energy by making lots of cells that are fermenting. Mm -hmm. Where where's fermentation come from? Lower life forms. That's how they make energy. And and it was Otto Warburg who figured out why oxygen was so important for humans and other animals and other mammals. It's because of our ability to oxidize the fuel and have this multiplier effect in terms of pr producing ATP. And the, the whole process of monitoring the amount of sugar and other nutrients in our diet becomes really, really important. You gotta have sensors that are saying, hey, are we do we have enough oxygen? Do we have enough sugar? Do we have a do we have do we have the right fats in our diet? And are we able to to burn them? And the primal mechanism for that is called AMPK. AMP kinase. And it turns out it's copper dependent. And it's the, it's the most sophisticated energy sensor we have in our body. And it's connected to the mitochondria, as you would expect. Well, playing in the background are hormones. And I'm not, you know, I'm by no means a hormone expert. And I'm, and I'm not an endocrinologist and I'm not an endocriminologist. Um, but hormones are really important for breaking down our food. 
uh, there's a triad in our gut called gastrin, secretin, and CCK, cholecystokinin. This is one of my favorite hormones, and I've talked about it morally, that you, that CCK is what tells your your brain, I've had enough to eat, right? So, right. so this is a really important hormone. So everybody really pay attention to what copper's relationship is to this hormone. Well, these three hormones work together. You're absolutely right about the signaling in the brain. It turns out that 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 neuropeptide, cholecystokinin, is called a neuropeptide, neurohormone, but neuropeptide's official name, <clears throat> has the highest expression in the brain. Newsflash, why are people getting neurodegeneration? They don't have enough CCK. And but here's the here's the catch. We make about 150 hormones in our body. And we're talking about three of them, gastrin, secretin, CCK. What the body makes is called pro-hormones. Think of a pro-hormone as your car that's parked in your driveway. It's there, but it can't do anything. When does your car become useful? when you turn on the engine and then you can drive it somewhere. All of these hormones need to be activated. And the official term is called alpha amidation. And that's a very biochemical way of saying activation. But what's happening is these hormones have a glycine residue at the end of what's called their carboxyl terminal, a C terminal, C for carboxyl. That's a COOH. And there's an enzyme, it's called the PAM enzyme, P-A-M. And that enzyme cleaves the hormone, cuts off the glycine in the carboxyl group, and attaches an amine group, which is NH2, and then suddenly, it's turned on. It's, it's literally like starting your car. It's literally like turning on the lights in your room, turning on your computer. It's that profound. It's dormant, then it's active. And that, that name of that enzyme, PAM, stands for peptidylglycine, the glycine residue. Peptidyl, peptidyl is peptide. The peptide glycine, alpha amidating, amidating at the alpha carbon, the number one carbon, monooxygenase. It means it's taking oxygen and using the energy of that oxygen to make this change. It's a major big deal. And what's particularly important about it, it requires two copper batteries. It doesn't work without copper. Mm. And <clears throat> this was first discovered in 1982. And then over the next, what, 40 years, they've been studying it intensively. And so those are, just, those are three really important digestive enzymes that need to be turned on with copper. But wait, there's more. You've, you've heard of insulin, right, Sarah? <laughs> I think everybody has, and insulin has become extremely dysregulated over the last couple of years. We have to be careful with how we talk about it, but what we're seeing is that it has become extremely dysregulated in the same person, eating the same food, nothing changing, insulin's being dysregulated, which could be leading to some of the unexplained weight gain, but let's yeah. get into it. Let, let's explain what's going on. So insulin is made in our pancreas. We know that, right? <clears throat> and what's, what's really important to understand about these hormones is every hormone has a receptor that it's got to fit into. All, and these receptors are where the download of information takes place. But it, it's got to be a, a secure 
connection. And that's what the activation of the hormone does. Once the hormone, once the hormone gets activated, it can fit in its receptor perfectly. If it's not, if it's not active, it doesn't fit. Can't, can't get in. And, and if I were to give you a toy that requires a battery, but forgot to put in the battery, and we went clinical studying your reaction to that toy, we would say, well, Sarah seems to have playtime resistance because mm -hmm. you're not playing with the toy because it doesn't work. There's no reason to play with it if, if it doesn't have the battery. Well, that's exactly what's happening inside our body. The insulin resistance is really the insulin can't be activated to make the secure connection. But there's one more step. Insulin has a regulator. There's another hormone that regulates insulin secretion. Its formal name is called incretin. Some people call it inc incretin. Another name for it is called GLP-1. You may have heard of that. Well, GLP-1, also made in the uh, pancreas, gets secreted, but it needs to be activated. So GLP-1 has to be activated in order to release the insulin, which also has to be activated before it can, can clear the, um, the sugar. And the reason why this is all so important is that a really uh, powerful model for glucose intolerance, because if you can't clear sugar, you, you, it's really that sugar is not your friend. It, it's, it's a very caustic element, as you probably know. Well, the, the most glucose intolerant people on planet Earth are children with what's called Menke's disease. Mm -hmm. Menke's affects the garage door. And it's an it's a, uh, enzyme called ATP7A, and it's sister enzyme is called ATP7B. Well, 7B is making ceruloplasm. 7A is making everything else. And ATP7A, that is a copper pump. These are copper pumps. They get activated with retinol. Fascinating. Retinoic acid is what activates those pumps. But the ATP7A is what loads the copper into the PAM enzyme. Mm. And so if the if the garage door is being affected by high fructose corn syrup, being affected by glyphosate, being affected by antibiotics, what will we've got a problem on our hands, right? And so the insulin resistance, it's highly correlated with iron accumulation, right? I mean, you can find it in the literature. Oh, it's oxidative stress. Well, what creates oxidative stress is iron, playing with oxygen. But why is the iron building? Because there's not enough bioavailable copper in the liver to regulate it. And so the iron starts to build, the oxidative stress starts to build, the receptors can't get the connection because the PAM enzyme you talk about a hidden hero. Well, copper is the hidden hero, but the granddaddy mechanism, the, the true unsung hero, I would, I would argue, is this PAM enzyme that stopped working a long time ago because of the changes in the food system and, farm, and farming system that we're alluding to. And I think... Um, the more recent events have been very hard on our minerals. And I renamed what COVID stands for. So COV stands for coppers vanished. And ID stands for irons dysregulated. Mm -hmm. And so that's a very different way of thinking about the, the drama and the trauma that we all live through. Mm -hmm. But if, as you come up the learning curve of minerals, you will see that dynamic playing out in our immune system. 
And so it's it's a very powerful mechanism is the dynamics between copper and iron. But what people need to understand is that copper is the general and iron is the foot soldier. If you want to really crystallize your understanding, picture the Battle of the Bulge with no Patton. General Patton's not there. What, ha what would have happened? It would have been a disaster. And so that's what's happening is our generals are missing their liver. The foot soldiers are building up. What are foot soldiers like when, they're, when there's no general around? They're just going to act out. That's what they're going to do. And they will create oxidative stress. And they will prevent optimal metabolizing of the fat because they're not going to allow for the cop. The copper's MIA. The copper's not available. Copper can't stop that P to E3. Copper can't activate the movement of fat into the mitochondria. Copper can't facilitate the beta oxidation enzymes. Copper can't activate the dozens of hormones. And all I've, all I've identified are five. I've just identified five. Folks, depending upon the author, it could be over 70, 150. The highest I've seen is 279. Let's just stay conservative. Let's just leave it at 70 hormones. 70 hormones. You, Here's another dimension that you, you may not have even thought of, Sarah. You've heard of the thyroid, right? This little butterfly, right? I, I, I definitely want to get into the copper and the thyroid because if you have hypothyroidism, which I believe nine out of 10 people are suffering from right. now, are right. you, you're not going to be able to lose weight. I wanted to just emphasize if anyone else missed this when Morley mentioned it, GLP-1. Have we heard that before? GLP-1? GLP-1 is what... Ozempic and Wagovi and all of these diabetic drugs that people are using for weight loss plays off of. So we are talking about copper as an integral part in your weight loss natural um, alternatives to these diabetic injections for non-diabetics. So just wanted to emphasize that if anyone missed that, but let's get into the thyroid and copper. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, everyone is aware of their numbers, I'm sure. They're at all concerned about their thyroid. They know their T4 and T3, free, free T4, TSH, TRH. Well, all of those need to be activated. They, they, they need to be alpha amidated. And so we're all used to working with computers. You and I are talking to each other via a computer. Everyone who's watching us right now is most likely doing it on a computer or, or a device like this, but most people are probably watching on a computer. Well, computers have what's called a motherboard. And we have a motherboard too. Our motherboard is called the HPA axis, hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal axis. Can't can't respond, we can't do anything without the HPA axis. Well, the, the highest concentration of the PAM enzyme expression is in the hypothalamus. Mm. And where is TRH made? Oh, yeah, it's made in the hypothalamus. Well, TRH, thyroid regulating hormone. It's the general for the thyroid. It sets the tone for the thyroid. And if the general is drunk, because there's not enough copper, the major, which is called TSH, it starts to scream, starts to yell. And so if your TSH is rising, if it's well above, I mean, shouldn't be above two, but if it's like in the fours and fives and sixes, which would send most endocrinologists into a tizzy, all it's telling you is you're copper deficient. And there's very interesting research coming out of Europe. So in Europe, they have what are called endocrinologists. In the U.S., we have what are called endocriminologists. And so in Europe, they're very focused on how does the body really work. And it turns out, and this is the work of Jens 
J-E-N-N-S, my tag, M-I-T-T-A-G, 2012. So it's ancient history, but it's brilliant. And what they discovered is that T3 is an oxygen sensor. Mm. It's smelling for oxygen and oxidative stress. Where is T3 hanging out? In the mitochondria. Now, the, the narrative that everyone's been trained by is that T3 is what runs the show and it activates the mitochondria, and that is a bold face lie. T3 is an oxygen sensor. That's a big job in and of itself. But what Dr. Maitag was able to figure out is that hormones are what? Signaling molecules. And when T3 senses that the oxygen level, the oxidative stress level is rising in the mitochondria, it sends a signal back to the liver and it says, hey, we need more of that ceruloplasmin thing because we need more copper in the mitochondria to respond to the oxygen that needs to be turned into water to release the energy molecules. And it's absolutely amazing that what Dr. Mytag did was he put the thyroid community on its ear and explained that T4 correlates beautifully with serum copper. Mm. T3 correlates beautiful with cerulean plasma. And not many people know that. I mean, people would, would dare to go into something, into literature that's more than a week old. And so some of the best articles I've read are from the 1910s, 1920s, not last week. I don't trust last week anymore. There's just too much, uh, too many vested interests. But, but the thing is, I think there's way more to the thyroid. And the reason why is that we've got this hypothalamus, and we have this pituitary that's right above the thyroid. So TRH is instructing TSH is then instructing thyroid hormone production. Most people who are hypothyroid have low levels of retinol in their diet. Why is, why is retinol so important? Well, retinol is what's activating the ATP7A. Retinol is what makes copper bioavailable. It's what makes the PAM enzyme work. And if, if the retinol can't be made into retinoic acid, and I believe it's 9-cis, I was just reading about this morning, 9-cis retinoic acid is what makes what's called RXR. And I'm getting into the deep weeds, Sarah. I'm, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I just Give you, give you and your listeners the full Monty here, but nine cis turns retinol into retinoic. Excuse me, turns it into RXR, retinoid X receptor. The retinoid X receptor needs to marry up with the thyroid receptor, and when those two come together, then you can have transcription to make T4. Mm -hmm. Anyone who has, has low thyroid function, hypothyroidism is low retinol. And I would argue they're very likely low copper. But no one's ever taken it in that way like uh, Dr. Maitag has in uh, Germany. And so it's a very different world there. And so when the, when the copper's right, when the retinol's right, the thyroid hormone's getting made, and then the thyroid hormone can be activated so it can do its job. Now, the part that I don't know yet, Sarah, is what, what is the metabolic impact of a hormone that's supposed to be activated, but it's not? Mm -hmm. what, what does CCK that's not activated do inside the body and our brain? What does, what does thyroid hormone do when it's not activated? Does it, does it still have some uh, capacity to stimulate change or some, stimulate some kind of function. It's very murky in the research. But then we get into things like orexin and um, 
oh my gosh, uh, vasopressin. And I mean, again, we, we can have a field day just talking about all the different hormones that get involved in this, this process. And, and um, oh, I'm blanking on the, uh, what's, what's the love hormone? Um, oh, <laughs> oxytocin. Oxytocin, thank you. Yeah. I, I thought that meant it had something to do with oxygen. No. Oxytocin is Greek for swift birth. And what's fascinating about oxytocin is it only has nine peptides in it. Nine. Not, oxytocin and vasopressin both have nine peptides. Mm. And, and the, the, the individual, the scientist who figured it out, his name was Vincent Duvigno. And he was a famous biochemist got his uh, terminal degree at uh, University of Rochester. And in 1953, a year after I was born, uh, he's up in Rochester and he's isolating oxytocin. He's sequencing oxytocin. He's replicating oxytocin mm -hmm. and he's activating oxytocin. 1953. Three. Wow. And that should make your listeners a little uncomfortable because that means, wow, they've known about this a long time. And what, what is not taught in doctor school? Everything that Sarah and I have been talking about for the last four yeah. years. Well, so, Marley, I, I mean, we could go on forever. We are definitely having you back. But I want to emphasize a few things that you we talked about was mm -hmm. copper and the thyroid copper and the regulating hormones for appetite, copper and insulin resistance and fatty liver disease. All of these mechanisms are part of unexplained weight gain and copper and GLP-1. And we didn't even get into iron dysregulating leptin hormone. Um, we didn't get into copper and its relationship to colitis and IBS which can also be a cause of weight gain. So Absolutely. there's so much more into this discussion. So before we go, tell people where they can find you and learn more. Yeah. Um, obviously on social media, um, the MAG Facebook group or the RCP page, um, the website rcp123.org. Um, I'm not sure when this is going to air, but I'll just share it that we're, we're having open enrollment. Um, and for the, the RCP Institute, if you want to learn the deep dive of what we've been just talking about uh, this afternoon, uh, we'll get into that in our classes. And it's um, a 16-week program that people find absolutely fascinating. And then I, I'm a regular on podcasts like this. I'm so grateful to, to Sarah and her colleagues out there who allow me the chance to share this, this wisdom. And... Um, let people know that there's more to the story. That's that's the key. If you want to read my book, it's called Cure Your Fatigue. Yeah. And uh, I don't go into the deep, deep dive I did today, but it'll give you the basics of, wow, why don't I feel right? Why am I fatigued? And I can't make energy. Well, you can't make energy because you don't have enough bioavailable, usable copper. And that's really at, at the very base of our uh, metabolism. Amazing. And the book is amazing. I've read it. And uh, Morley, you are just a wealth of knowledge. And we will be having you back and continuing the discussion. And this is literally why I came out with the accelerated scalar copper. Um, like my silver and like the accelerated gold, it is made with scalar copper technology. And it's the only nano scalar copper solution treated with water implosion technology and enhanced with scalar frequencies to enhance the absorption. 99% absorption made with ozone, ozonated and UV sterilized distilled water and 99.99 um, ultra fine pure scalar copper. So just wanted to, to mention that it has been a part of my protocol. I even sprayed on my face for my skin, uh, mm -hmm. right? And I spray it in my scalp. I, I do it. I bathe in it just like I do with the accelerated silver. So thank you, Morley. And thank you, everyone else, for joining me, us today. And if I can help you, you can contact me directly through the website, sarabantahealth.com. Happy to put together a protocol for you. What did you learn today? 
pretty mind blowing that copper could be the missing key to your weight loss goals. Um, leave a comment. Let me know. And join the free group coaching on Telegram with the link below. I teach you on a daily basis with tips and tools to enhance your health. And the group support is amazing. The protocols and supplements I always discuss are at sarabantahealth.com. You can follow me on Facebook and Instagram under Accelerated Health Products across over 100 channels under Accelerated Health TV and Radio Show. And if you like what you hear today, please hit the subscribe button. Join us every Monday at 2 p.m. Pacific, Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Pacific, and use coupon WELCOME10 for 10% off site-wide. Thanks again for joining us and have a great week.